You're listening to Health Coach Conversations, a podcast where our conversations help health coaches all around the world to level up our businesses and to get more clients. Hello and welcome to week two with Dr. Norman E. Rosenthal. He is a world-renowned psychiatrist, public speaker, and best-selling author. If you didn't hear our podcast last week on SAD, I recommend that you go back and listen to it after today's talk on psychiatry and health coaching. Talking about your transition from uh, psychiatry, and it's really not a full transition. You're still doing psychiatry. You're just doing probably a lot more coaching than you did before, right? Right. Right. Well, you know, I came into it organically because what would happen is maybe somebody would come to me with a mood problem and I would give them an antidepressant and various things to get them out of their depression. And then somehow they found that it was useful to keep coming after they were better from their depression. And I would think to myself, now, why are they still coming? Obviously, they're getting something valuable. So then I sort of broke it down in my own mind. What is it that I'm doing? And I found that there were many things that would qualify as coaching, you know, helping them negotiate their way through a complex business situation, a difficult boss. How could they handle the difficult boss so that they didn't have to feel like a a little bug on the wall, but that they could get what they needed out of the work and how they could shift their their scene from it's me versus him to what is this work all about? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? And even go back to him and say, you know, when he was maybe uh, diminishing or, or, you know, um, nasty in some way or, or another, and say, you, you know, I understand that you don't like the way I dress or whatever, but, but let, can we focus on the work and what's important here, or, you, you, you know? And then, you know, basically, in many instances, the, the supervisee will actually supervise the supervisor because a lot of these supervisors or bosses don't know how to lead. And the, supervi- and, and the supervisee or the underling, if you want to call it, will say, you know, what would really help me is if you could do this and this. And you, you'd, you'd see that I would give you a better product or better service. And if the supervisor has got any sense, they will listen. In fact, I, one of my books is called The Gift of Adversity. I love that and, one. <laughs> yeah. And one of the adversities was... I arrived at Columbia Medical Psychiatric Residency, and I got the supervisor who was very smart, but he was somewhat arrogant, and he would rip my writing to shreds. And one day I came in with a migraine, and he said, has that got something to do with the way I'm supervising? I said, actually, yes, I'm glad you mentioned it, because you know I've never had this kind of sort of harsh feedback, and I'm not sure it's useful. And he must have had that same message given to him before because he clicked in gear and said, well, that's not the goal here. The goal here is for you to learn, not for you to feel put upon. And we're going to change our methods. And he completely shifted gears. And then I thought, you know, wow, sometimes the supervisee can supervise the supervisor. So that was the key to me that I As I went through my career, I picked up things that were really crucial lessons that are hard to get just out of a book. And so I managed a group at the NIH uh, of research assistants, other psychiatrists, doctors, helped them write their papers, helped them get through whatever they needed to. And then after 20 years at the NIH, where I did, in fact, lead the team that described SAD, I opened my own research research business. So now I'm in business, so I'm having to deal with all the kind of business aspects and making a go of things and making it work. Now I'm not getting funded by the government. Now I'm going to have to have my own research funded. And I did. And I was able to do things like the Botox for depression study. 
which I, I did through a grant and which was one of the most fun studies. I also researched transcendental meditation for post-traumatic stress disorder for people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. So I had experience in the government. I had experience in the private sector. I had experience as a psychiatrist. And on the receiving end, I, I consumed what I dispensed because I think it's really important to understand yourself and your own stuff and what you bring to the exchange that may be holding back the progress of the organization or the enterprise. And so from all these different things, uh, the meditation, et cetera, et cetera, it was a course from life in every aspect. And so people started finding me to be helpful, and that's how I became a coach. You found that you could help people a little bit more deeply by doing that, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I enjoy that, you know, these are often people who are very competent they're just missing certain elements in the mix and just helping them a little bit can really go a long way. And it was very, very gratifying to discover that. What type of people do you most often work with? I work with people who are already having some measure of success in their area. So for example, it could be a Wall Street financier, it could be a CEO, it could be anybody really. It, you know, uh, it could be. I'm just thinking of my a lawyer who, you know, is is running a big program. Program directors, mostly they're people who are rather competent, but they just want to get those few extra steps and. And oftentimes, you know, these people have problems of their own with nobody to talk to about them because it's lonely at the top. And so there's nobody that they can talk to about, you know, the fact that their wife has left them or, you know, they're trying to date, but there it's hard to find somebody and to really know that she loves him for himself as opposed to his bank balance. So, you know, how do, how do they navigate these complex aspects of their lives? And so I, I find that it's one of my areas of specialty to help people who live complex lives, trying to balance their work, their emotional life, their physical health, their well-being, trying to take care of themselves very often. They have been people whose parents have been very ambitious for them, emphasized accomplishments over self-care. And so they don't automatically take care of themselves. It takes them a while to understand that they are entitled to nurturance for themselves and of themselves. You know, I mean... We don't always have somebody around to, to give us good messages. We've got to internalize those messages. So these are some of the things that I enjoy doing and that people, you know, you, you find out what you do well by who comes to you. And those people are the people who have basically come to me because they feel like I've mastered some of these steps. Of course, you never, you can always learn something new. So I don't want to sound like I'm, I've arrived. I haven't. You never arrive. It's always part of a journey, right? But I'm on that journey and I'm delighted to help other people who are also on that journey. Um, technically, how does the coaching integrate with your psychiatry business? Uh, you actually are involved in, you've got the research, you still have the research companies? No, the research no. company I've left. Okay. The NIH I've left, I've left those behind. The only things that I'm doing now are my psychiatry and my coaching and writing books. Okay. Which is a passion of mine. And and you do it well. <laughs> okay, so so somebody comes to you first for psychiatry or do they come to you for coaching or does it intermingle? Well, you know, they come for help. They okay. come and say, I've got thus and such a problem. And can you help me? And I start, then I start asking more questions. 
I really want to understand when did the problem start? Have they had it before? Have they had help for it? What helped? What didn't help? I have become terribly curious. And so I'm a very curious person. I'm really very interested. I'm interested in people. And so I'm really interested. And then so we're rolling up our sleeves together. And then once I've got a sense of what the situation is, I say, look, this is what seems to me would be helpful. And then I, you, you know, I suggest some things and, and I say, you know, we can start and see what works and what doesn't work. And I'm very experimental. You know, I bring my uh, background as a researcher to my work. So you know, you, yeah, go ahead. You, I'm sorry. You enter into it just with the idea that you're going to help and you let how yeah. you're going to help happen, right? Yeah. I don't say which practice am I going to put this in? Am I going to put him there or am I going to put him there or her or whatever? But then somebody will, will develop maybe in, as, as we go along, it'll be clear this person's depressed. And I'll say, you know, you're trying very hard and you're working very hard, but you still seem quite depressed. How would you feel about us trying an antidepressant and seeing whether it makes a difference? And they might be very receptive and we'll, we'll try that or some other, you know, and I can remember one coaching client and some problems arose in his, in his life. And he, he was actually a coach himself, a very a senior coach who came to me. And as part of the coaching, some issues arose. And he said, you know, I think I could use some therapy on that. I said, fine, let's do that. And we, we morphed into that until the issue was resolved, which, which it was. And then we got back to the coaching again. So I see it as a fluid thing. And because I have both skill sets and both experiences, I can move easily from one to another without saying, oh, well, now I've got my coaching hat on. And now I've got my, it's not, the brain is not cut up like that. It's all part of the same dilemma, which is how are we going to live our lives happily, effectively, productively? How do you deal with people who have lost interest in their life? Do you have that very often where they're just, they don't have the zest that they used to have for living? Yes, you know, and there again, you know, I, I might first ask them to have a thorough physical and blood work. Let's say it's a man in his 60s, and then you find out that his testosterone levels are very, very low. So I say, well, you know, it seems like you could use supplementation of that. Could be a woman and, and she could have a hormonal story or any story. But I'm just taking a man because it's such a simple circumstance when the testosterone is low. I'll say, well, let's try more. And then he might say, you know, I'm just feeling so much better. Or if it's the winter, I might see he's lost interest. I say, well, you know, last summer, you seem to have a lot of interest. Let's get you a light. Let's try some light. Well, it's helping a little bit. I say, well, let's try some more light. You, you, you know, so, so I'm open to not jumping to conclusions. By testing something and then seeing, is it yielding results or isn't it? I'm, I'm as curious and open. I don't jump to a conclusion because you could jump to a conclusion. It could be the wrong conclusion. And then you could waste weeks and months barking up the wrong tree. You know what I mean? So I'm really open to continually modifying what I'm seeing and using the patient or the client and I become collaborators. We work together to try to figure out what's going on. So you're saying it's really important to go in with no preconceived notions and be open to whatever comes to you, right? Definitely. Very much so. You summed it up. What sort of creative problems do people bring to your attention that you can help with? All right. So, off, well, well, what I'm helping a lot of different people with is, 
is maybe writing a book. They've always wanted to write a book. Where do they begin? Well, I've written 11 books, so I do have some, and I've, over the many have gone into other editions and translations, so I have some experience. So, I mean, just yesterday, I mean, you know, I'll connect people up together. I might say, well, you know, you don't feel confident writing, but you've got this friend who's an outstanding writer, and you've got this outstanding area of expertise that you want to see a book written, but you don't know where to start, why not collaborate with your friend and see if he or she can help you with the writing and you can provide some of the, you know, so that's a creative solution. Got right back to me, said, that's a great idea. I'm going to explore that. I love to foster other people's creativity. You know, that's just one example. There are other examples where I say, you know, this could really, I could really see this working. Or I might say, you know, it's a lovely idea, but you're not going to get a market for that particular subject. You know, nobody, death and dying may be not the, the most popular topic, and it's very hard to get readers. And you want to start with something that's a little more upbeat, I think, for your first book. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. So yeah. Once you've got a readership, okay, they'll, you've got a following, but for your first book, I think you really want something that helps people a little differently. You know, I might say that. I'm just giving you hypotheticals. They're based on circumstances that I've come across, but uh, I love helping people create. Like at the at the NIH, I had many young psychiatrists that I tried to put onto various projects that they might uh, make contributions on, you know, if because they were there to try to become creative researchers. And likewise with people in the arts, you know, I love encouraging, I love encouraging them. My son right now, who is also a psychiatrist, who's trying to become a novelist. It was really fun reading, reading the draft of his novel and giving him some suggestions and you, I just it's something I really enjoy. I enjoy seeing the joy that people have when they create. That's great. And you have done creative, you did some poetry too, didn't you? Well, the poetry I did was not my own poetry. What I have found over my lifetime is that some poems have been incredibly helpful to me. And that I go back to them and I read them and I thought, you know, let me pull together a collection, maybe of 50 poems that have helped people who I have coached or treated or me. And so I've organized the 50 poems. It's called Poetry Rx, Poetry as Treatment. And the idea came to me, I was talking with a friend and he said, you know, I've, I've lost this person and I feel devastated and I don't know how I'll ever move on from here. And he was an artist. And so, you know, I try and use language that I think is going to resonate with the person I'm talking to. So I said, you know, losing is an art. And like every art, it, ha- it can be cultivated, it can be developed. He said, oh, my God, have you read that poem? I said, I don't know what poem you're referring to. So he it was on the phone. He pulls this book off the the shelf and starts reading to me Elizabeth Bishop's One Art, (laughs) which starts, the art of losing isn't hard to master. So right there, she's saying, losing is an art, the art of losing. And he reads it to me. And, of course, it's a stunningly fascinating poem. And at the end, I could hear his voice lifting up and his depressed voice becoming lighter. And I felt lighter. And I thought, wow, that's incredible that a poem can make you feel less depressed. So then I went scampering around, pulling together poems that could influence people. And I divided the book up into loving and losing, responses to nature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through aging and dying. And they're poems that can help at each stage. And then, so I put out the poem there. Then I tell people what I think the poem is trying to say. And then I 
pull out specific takeaway points. And one of the most exciting experiences happened when I sent it to Jane Brody. She was a columnist for the New York Times for many years. She wrote a column called Personal Health, where she took personal experiences and elaborated a brilliant writer. And, you know, so she'd done some of my stuff before in her columns, and I I contacted her and, and said, you know, I've got this poetry book. And she said, I, I, don't, I, I don't care for poetry. I said, well, can I send it to you anyway? She said, okay, but don't expect me to get to it anytime soon. So <laughs> she was giving it to me straight. So I sent it to her. And the next day I get, I get a change of plans. We're doing it tomorrow. It's poetry week. I've read it through. I think you've got something there. And she then wrote, you know, one of the most lovely poem, lovely pieces that has ever been written and something I've written. She went to a friend who uses poetry in just the way I said. An old friend of hers picks up her poetry book every morning, flips it open to somewhere, and that becomes her poem of the day that she uses for inspiration and for encouragement. And then she realized, Jane, that her husband had been a lyricist. He'd worked with words, and somehow she was kind of defending herself against the whole area. And to her great credit, she changed her mind. And that yeah. really got the word out about the book. I, I love it. It's my favorite book I, of that I've written. It's my favorite of, of the ones I've written because I, I've got next to my bedside, and I'll pull it open, and I'll read a poem, you know, before bedtime. and. Now that's that's a great story too. We'll we'll put a list of all your books at the bottom of the podcast, so everybody can either get them all and go through one at a time, or get one at a time. Let's talk about how you see or perceive the use of coaches with psychiatrists and how they could maybe collaborate to make a better mental health space. Well, I think that's a great question because, you know, firstly, there are not enough psychiatrists around. And the psychiatrists who are around have not actually been taught how to coach. They've been taught how to diagnose, how to prescribe, maybe, if you're lucky, how to do a little bit of therapy. Cognitive behavior therapy is the one that's most commonly used these days. But the complexity of a coach's job is not part of their training, nor are they all that interested in it. And it's hard to find time for all of that, isn't it? The time is a real problem. The time is a real problem. So I would suggest that coaches should introduce themselves to psychiatrists mm -hmm. and say, you know, this is what I do. And, you know, maybe sometime you might have a client who you have actually treated in the primary ways that psychiatrists do. but who could use a little extra help. You may feel like, well, you know, this is not really something where deep therapy is needed, but a person struggling with a job, struggling with a relationship, struggling with herself is, is something that coaches can help with. And here's my card. So something like that. You know what I'm saying? They should introduce themselves to psychiatrists. And also, you know, this is all a business anyway. We all earn our livings this way. So if a coach will refer somebody to a psychiatrist right. for, you know, I've got a coaching client and she seems to be a little depressed, would you evaluate that and possibly treat her? And then the psychiatrist not only wants to pay back the favor, which is an unfortunate concept, but it's real. But the psychiatrist realizes that this coach is really doing something very useful. I do, I do refer people, for example, to an organizational coach. You know, I'm not the best person to say, here's how you organize your week, draw up this kind of table, have this kind of computer program, which color codes your different. I've got one coach who's helping a senior in college, organize 
with color codes, his different subjects. And this is not my <laughs> style, you know. I, I, my assistant, as you saw earlier on, can help me with the co or with the organization <laughs> when we when I couldn't unmute your your uh, message. So, but but this, you know, if there's somebody who's got a set of expertise that I don't have, I'm happy to collaborate because God knows there's enough to go around for everybody. It's not a problem. And so I think the coach, the help can have happen both ways. I will refer to a coach when it's outside of my best skills. They may refer to me and that's how it works. You believe in personalized care. You don't think that there's any out of the box formula to help people, do you? You know, or, you know, it's hard to say that. I believe in what I do, mm -hmm. and I've been doing it for decades, and I see its its effects. I also believe that not everybody has the time to do that. Not everybody has all the skills to do that. And so I will not put down, you know, somebody who has a 15-minute session with somebody and says, take this and this medicine and uh, I'll see you in a month or whatever, whatever. That may be what that model permits. And right. Right. so I, I don't want to denigrate any type of care that's out there because not everybody can do what I do or can afford it necessarily. And so, but, but, but I'm so happy to be here on your show and be able to disseminate some of my thoughts and ideas in case people out there might find them useful. Right. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I appreciate it. I appreciate the extra time you spent with me. And I know that everybody that listens to this is going to learn a lot and take a lot from each different section. Well, if I may say on my side, it's really been a pleasure talking with you. And I wish you lots of luck with this podcast. And I have enjoyed your openness and interest in so many aspects of things. Thanks for listening to the show. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating or review on iTunes.